we meet here today, we think of the thousands of years that Aboriginal people lived in this area. Imagine them on in Alambi with beautiful land, looking out, watching the, the waves, watching for uh, whales, and it would have been such a beautiful place. We remember these people and we say thank you to them because they looked after this land for thousands of years. Since then, well, we can keep learning from them, I think, because we have failed to uh, really look after the land as they did. And we'd like to acknowledge their amazing people, their amazing life here on, in Australia, and we say thank you to them. Words, rhythms and stories. <laughs> There's a warm melting in my heart without resistance, gentle, very gentle, opening to the moment, suggesting possibilities. This moment, this day, forgiveness reaches me. The aching heart is pacified. There's only melting. Just melting. Candle. I like to light a candle as I read, eat or write. My companion, slim, tall, white. Brought to life when lit. Some of the wick remains black, while the candle melts its way to consequence. Hot wax trickles over the lip, the brim. The flame flickers, breathes, reaching up again and again. I see the candle burn. Thought. The words come slowly, silently, with the quietness of a butterfly. Forgiveness, forgiveness, genuine forgiveness born in the bone marrow can be a long and subtle process. Even though I've forgiven and been forgiven, there was never assurance I would forgive when next needed or that I had been forgiven enough. Once I had a grace. A friend betrayed me and I was furious. After some time, my sense of superiority and condescension dissolved. It came in the form of a prompting. My list and description of past personal wrongdoings, my weaknesses and errors were astound her to the point of disbelief, if I chose to tell her. I realised her offence was minor compared to my past agenda, both conscious and unconscious. 
frog. I exited from the lift and turned left. Isabel came towards me. We nodded and smiled as we passed. Then Isabel came back. I have a little frog. He lives on my plant in the terrace. I poured water on the leaf and watched it trickle down. I thought he might be hot, so I sprinkled water on his head. I put a bowl of water down in case he wanted to swim, but he didn't move. Yesterday I looked and he had disappeared, but he's back again today. Question. Did Adam have a navel? <laughs> Amy. I think Amy is very angry. She's certainly angry with me. We had a misunderstanding. She insists she said one thing and I said it was not the case. The question arises. Is Amy telling porkies? I'm not. When last I phoned, she didn't want to talk to me. She's the only person on the planet that doesn't want to talk to me. I think Amy is very angry. My first barn dance. was held in the corrugated iron exhibition hall at the Grafton Showground. I went with my cousin Alice. We were the same age, 17. In new outfits we were driven to the dance, stars the sentinels. We entered the crowd and stood with all the girls. Music blared and the boys gathered at the opposite end in loud, nervous conversation and laughter. I waited in complete self-consciousness as one by one each girl was chosen to dance. Eventually, I was asked. My partner was short and stocky. He had B.O. very smelly, which came from the woolen suit he wore in the heat of the hot northern night. As we danced stiffly, he told me he was a cane cutter from down river. I put my right hand into his left. His hands were coarse and sweaty and his thumbs as big as bananas. <laughs> the music loud, the air smoky. We two robots paced the floor. At last, the national anthem. We stood still and silent. As singles and couples drifted into the night, I had one thought. I won't be doing that again in a hurry. <laughs> yellow bananas. Two yellow bananas greet me from the fruit bowl. They rest upon an apple and an orange. Other apples sit snugly around the circumference. The apples are small, orange and gold, the colours of the rising sun. Like all apples, there's a dimple at the bottom and a stalk at the top with a comforting spherical shape. Universal to all varieties. Inside all apples is a secret. The apples have dark seeds. If the apple is sliced open cylindrically, behold, the seeds appear held by 
indented marks in the pattern of a star. How far is it to Bethlehem? Not very far. Shall I find a tiny bay lit by a star? passionate appetite for silence. It comes on me in drifts, in drips and drabs, in echoes of itself, with freshness, fragrant. It's just another surprise in the ongoing ageing process. Sometimes I wander around my home singing I might stop and watch the vine of jasmine indenting its delicate shadows on my balcony tiles. Or watch the pattern of froth of washing liquid, cloud-like, and the clouds rearranging themselves by an invisible agent. On the surface of the silky water, soft, so soft, the bubbles disappear and pop up again. I am comforted by the warm water on my aging hands. When I ache in body or heart, I sit. I am consoled and befriended. Everything else disappears. Just me, sitting without another soul in sight. In my childhood I would lie on the warm grass scantily clad with legs stretched or crossed. I'd gaze up, 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 up to the clear light-filled Asia sky. Who would want anything more? Waiting. Most days I sit at my desk waiting for words to come, always experiment, always adventure. Stillness is the bridge between everything sensed and nothing. I close my eyes. I wait for the sacred news, for direction. It comes, one sentence, one word. The single word communicates its intention. I write on blank paper to avoid distraction and I might relax while I wait. I might stretch my bare feet on the resilient carpet or listen with selfless expectancy. I realise my blessing of gift was made possible by many people's prior and various contributions and even sacrifices, beginning with the young nun who taught me through her challenging but chosen vocation, her doubts and the complexity of her striving ideals failing often, yes, her offering has brought me to this day by teaching me to read and write, costing her no less than everything, and for me, opening doors for over 70 years. Childhood. Things. 
Things are as they are. That yellow crinkly skin on the lemon in the fruit bowl, echoing boldly yellow chrysanthemums close by. Questions. There are always questions. At age seven, I was taught from the catechism the following, who made the world? God made the world. Who is God? God is the creator of heaven and earth and the supreme Lord of all. Where is God? God is everywhere, but we do not see him. Why do we not see God? We do not see God because he is a pure spirit. What is a pure spirit? A pure spirit is one who has never been united to a body. I always felt satisfied asking and answering these questions in rote with the rest of the first class. It was as if all the mysteries of the universe were completely covered. Not that I'd put it that way then, but the rhythm. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. It captured me. I only sensed words and rhythms, that was enough. The implication and possibility of the authoritarian exegesis dawned on me slowly over time. Everything could be reduced to black and white until the dawning. Grey, grey, grey areas are where the adventure, the magic lies. Alive. There's no doubt about it, I'm glad to be alive. I have the memory of this feeling floating in and out of my childhood, pushing higher and higher on the swing, running in and out of a shower of water coming from a hose high in a tree, playing dress ups, old dresses, handbags, hats, shoes abandoned by my mother. My cousin learned dancing, tap dancing, Irish and Scottish, the sailor's hornpipe. She glided through the complex movements of the sword dance, not ever in my memory, touching the blades. We spent many years together playing in sand pits, finding exquisite shells in rock pools at Yamba. Mothers and fathers in cubby houses. My favourite guys was to stuff a pillow, pillow sorry, on my belly, cover it with a loose dress from my collection and walk around bulging. It was the obvious game to play since we were surrounded by pregnancy with not ever once wondering how this came about. Until much later. Nonetheless, we knew how to walk slowly with our bump and also how to give birth. I'd lie on the ground when my baby was ready to come. I'd puff and scream while my cousin Alice would deliver the baby. The lump removed safely, and a little naked doll emerged, crying. <laughs> My paternal grandmother had ten children, all born at home in Tatton. As her delivery began, with expected moans, groans and screams, <coughs> my father and his brothers and sisters would scramble under the house where they were entertained by the drama upstairs. Violets. As a 
child, I love to walk the secret narrow path to the left side of our house. It was always damp and mostly in deep shadow. Bulging variegated hydrangeas were dependent on the various qualities in the soil for colour. And there, hidden among the leaves, were patches of purple, delicate violets. I would bend and put my face to the blooms to inhale their fragrance, to ponder. I never saw fairies, but I'm sure they were there. Alphabet. When six years old, I was taught the alphabet. A couple of years later, I trained myself to say the alphabet backwards. I knew myself to be very smart. Playing hopscotch was a favourite game, with a tour and a partner. I'd toss my poor, small piece of stone, a heavy seed pod, or some broken china, and jump the pattern up to where the tour landed. First, Home, up and back, was a triumphant winner. <clears throat> In looking at the broken pattern of the china piece, I longed for it still to be part of the parent plate or saucer. I felt sorry for the exiled object as I held it in my hand. Worms. As a youngster, I was taught about earthworms. Later, I learned they were called hermaphrodites. The function of a male and female in a single worm seemed a practical solution. To have on board everything needed for a full life. I would dig for earthworms. I knew where they congregated. I'd hold the worm on the palm of my hand, soft, wrinkly, ticklish, slimy. I'd gaze as it wriggled. It didn't seem to have a front or a back, a beginning or end. Just a random choice for the worm, frontwards, backwards. I trusted worms. They didn't bite or sting. As time passed, I realised that worms ate dead bodies. This made me wonder how worms made their way into coffins. How did they get there? I liked to remember scary things when I was little. Was I adopted? Or travelling the ghost train at Luna Park, dark and full of shocks? Climbing too high in a tree, almost treading on a snake? Being chased by a barking dog while riding my bicycle, being donned down by magpies in spring? to safeguard their young. Yes, I was frightened. But when the crisis passed, I was left exhilarated. Chooks. Chooks were part of my childhood. At the back of our Berimba Street house, we had a lemon tree beside the incinerator. The tree was surrounded by a high fence and chicken wire to allow the chickens to look out and to keep them in with generous proportions in which to roam. My job was to feed the chooks each day. Scraps soffered on the egg stove in the mornings and grain in the late afternoon. I'd spread the grain in a wide berth the chickens then had an equal chance for the food. Even so, 
It was always a signal for confusion and extreme enthusiasm. Black feathers as dark as night, shiny as velvet, perky red clothes, and startling triangular feet with claws. Quite in contrast to feathers. The legs were pale yellow, like the lemons above, but covered in rough, prehistoric, scaly skin. Claws scratched the dirt for worms or other tasty morsels. The hens made dips in the soft earth like a nest. Here they indulged in a dry bath, scratching soil and thrusting it up through their feathers to eradicate unwelcome guests. Come evening, the chooks would perch in the lemon tree, tuck in their heads and sleep till dawn, when, promptly and perfectly, the rooster would crow. Every day there would be the magic and mystery of brown and white eggs, warm and elliptical, from sparrows to dinosaurs. Sometimes my father would kill a hen for Sunday lunch. I'd watch in anguish and wonder at the macabre event. First, catch the creature, who, knowing the chase was on, would dive and take refuge in the chaos of birds around, noisy and frightened. With one dive, Dad would catch the victim, hold it on the chopping block with his left hand and then, with the axe in his right, the blade would aim and descend as swift and sharp as a guillotine. One clean chop, no second chance, and the head would separate from the body. Blood spurted everywhere. When my father stood up for a stretch, to my astonishment, the headless hen would spring off the block and jump around spontaneously, eerily, compulsively, erratic. I was witness to this often, yet each time the headless chicken jumped, all my worlds were turned upside down. <coughs> Nature. Summer. In summer at night, our kitchen floor became a thoroughfare for fat and agile cockroaches, scuttling in their diagonal mission across the lino floor. If the light was turned on suddenly, a collection of creatures ran this way and that, a signal for a large green hidden frog to gulp and leap and catch anything in its path. Frogs love to hide behind the rim of the toilet basin of the outside lab. Unknown to the novice, when the basin was flushed, the four-legged surprise leapt into the air with a flourish. It only needed to happen once for the culprit's initiation. Autumn. Cold autumn. Early morning. Leaves crisp, crunchy, felled, failing, falling, sunlight wrap around from dark soil, tree, long plunge upwards, wisteria, full mouth fading, delicate beyond lace, gossamer touch, lattice scrambling. Here I am, all you see is me. A loud guttural sound pierces the ear. 
an indigenous bird hides in the bottle brush, bushy green, old bare trunk branches rise high before any foliage appears. Sage leaves pointed are in contrast to the dark trunk. Its flower producing has ceased, except for that one pale red bloom. No abundance of honey left to delight the small birds. We are in the subtle turn to autumn. Dew on the grass early morning. The temperature drops. My neighbour across the green has hanging baskets full of petunias, once purple, white and pink. Now blossoms faded. All you see is an hilarious green dripping over the edge of the hanging baskets. I saw a bird. I saw a bird fly perpendicular right up the branch of the <coughs> leafy gum tree. He must have found a clear passage close to the trunk and yes, with perpendicular confidence, body flat and poised, up he went. <coughs> At times through the day, especially at feeding time, the air is busy with the full, raw sounds of Australia and delicate chirps of migrant birds. Such tiny creatures with resonating cries, full throttled songs, piercing, piercing. Growing older. Slowing down. After my unknown pinnacle, I have begun gradually slowing down. I'm too stiff now to touch my toes. Yes, I'm certainly on the down slope. My hair, all of it, is grey and thinning. My fingernails sometimes brittle. Flesh drooping, wrinkly. I have a new knee and have achieved grandmother status, widowhood and accepted with gratitude a walking stick. If I didn't have a stick, I'd be very unstable. I have a plate in my mouth, have made a will and organized a prepaid funeral. I live in a quiet retirement village with accommodation for 300 people. Our dwellings sit in nine acres of controlled bushland, bringing birds, butterflies, and every kind of flying insect. The buildings are scattered with winding paths connecting us all. People here die or move to a nursing home. Others use walkers, sticks, and motorized scooters. The usual health issues include deafness, dicey hearts, bad backs, dementia in its early stages, one false eye, and every kind of mobility problem. There are those with allergies, high medication, too high often, including antidepressants and anti-anxieties. There are lost and lonely people hanging on relentlessly to their past and may be frightened of death. 
missing close relatives and friends who have predeceased them. The gossip trail is cruel and robust. Did you know Eileen died last night? Who should walk in the door but Eileen? <laughs> Norma's in hospital. She won't be coming back. Oh, hello Norma. <laughs> Did you notice that Irene wore that pink cardigan yesterday? And the day before? And the day before that? Around the fire, the gospel, the gossips assemble regularly. Mostly someone in the group is not talking to someone else. And once again, there's a rich collection of ailments talked about again and again. While the 99-year-old, the once champion gossiper, snoozes in her corner seat. I begin to live in a twilight world. The divine draws closer and so does death. Death will be my fulfilment. I don't feel afraid, but might when the time comes. What I fear is karma loca when I'll feel deep remorse at having hurt others. Glimpses of my past flood gently back at me, of recent past right back to early childhood. Yesterday, I remembered the first time I saw an elephant. I was seven years old. The circus with its animals, clowns and big top had come to town. Most of the animals were in cages, but suddenly, just there, was the largest living thing I'd ever seen. The elephant was rocking gently. His trunk was limp. From a short distance I could see the whole elephant. When I drew closer he was so big I remember looking up in disbelief. His belly well up from the ground. I could have walked underneath bowing my head. His leathery skin a murky grey gladdened me. His trunk moved up and down, curled, then uncurled. He had big ears and two white horns and such a tiny tail, ridiculous. <laughs> As I walked around, I felt deep affection for the lone creature. Yet, it couldn't speak. Even though I loved his silence, I was very glad it was fettered. When it ate, I was surprised when the trunk became an arm with lips and the arm curled to put the food into his unusually shaped mouth. What a good idea. I wake with a jolt. My ageing process proclaims itself once again. Nerve endings in the tips of my fingers coagulate sometimes as if a minute atrophy sets in. I drop objects without warning. Plastic bounces. China breaks. Glass shatters. Liquids spread. Meantime, the skin on my feet and lower legs turns technicolour. I wait, move slowly, more so than I did last year. I'd like to talk to a retired astronaut, one of the early pioneers. Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, these days, we have women astronauts. I'd like to talk to them. 
That cobweb is shining rainbows in the sun after rain. A white spiral holds the pages of my notepad together to support opening, just like that. Cloud patterns never repeat themselves. I hear silence. The abyss. Abyss, depth, deep, as deep as the ocean floor. I don't want to go there, visited, and by grace survived. Hopeless paralysis, dark burning desert, swamped, doubt, Despair, anger, gripped horror, bound tight, Golgotha, left abandoned. As a new widow, I grieved. The grief prolonged, indigo to black. Go away, the mantra. As I plunged into depression, withdrawal. Don't come, go away. Hidden under blankets, curled. No energy, no hygiene, no appetite. In and out of the psychiatric geriatric wing. Out and in. Locked in. Shock treatment again and again. Confusion, futility, memory loss. Medication. Medication, medication. No stop for over a decade. Three weeks or three months hospitalized. The top psychiatrist. Alma, you've had a full life. You'll just have to accept. You'll be depressed for the rest of your life. No! Oh. Take your tablet. For shock treatment. Walking with a bundle of medical records and a nurse. Through locked doors. Through the young people's ward. Students, parents, housewives and all. Past patients in recovery. Men, women, youth, students, homeless, aged, <coughs> wrinkled grey hair or robust hair of youth. Unlock the door. Good morning, come in. I step up, lie down. The professionals gather round. The electrical paraphernalia is attached. Plastic cupped over my nose. The gas trickles in. I float into sublime bliss. Nothing. I know nothing as my body shudders to the shocks. I wake into my new hell, startled. Tea and sandwiches back in the ward. Nights are worse. Patients scream and cry and wander, angered by failed suicide attempts. 
Every two hours, the night duty nurse shines a torch into the face of every patient. Abrupt, sleep, awake, again and again. Wake up, sleep, wake up, door. It was the day the young psychologist came to me, sat my bedside and asked, Who are you, Alma? I have no idea. <laughs> With that, a bolt of energy came to me. I knew at once that I must write, I could write now, to explore such an intriguing question. I pursued my call, the words flowed. My new friend came regularly to listen to my story. Within two weeks, after three months in enclosed misery, I penned my way to healing. On reflection, I realised this young doctor saw me as a person, not an illness. Each time he sat beside me, more life returned and remained. Dramatically and with certainty, I knew I was on my way to recovery. My depression is now past tense with the treasure of manifold insights. to see. I cry out in exultation of the reality before me, more ancient than the town crier, more accurate than the telephone. I see from above, so can understand the connection, the deed done here resonating there. The absence there means nowhere, nothing, everything and ever after, whatever you're after. Before you go any further, let me remind you, I see everything from above, below and sideways. I am bird's eye view. <laughs> Questions. Oh, it's you. I never knew. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you come sooner? Where have you been all this time? I didn't know it was quite like that. What will you do now? When? Why? Are you sure? Are you quite sure? You won't be sorry. You'll never marry. Who'll tell Harry? Is that your solution? Free from confusion of the other issue? We'll miss you. Skeletons. Rattle bones, rattle teeth, rattle, scuttle the black mouse over the thigh bone, hollow socket gorge on dark silence of irrelevancies. A cupboard is a grave concern, 
upstarting the whole six foot dark, waiting through the centuries for the corpse of gender, fabric, fortune, of ailment and predicament of death, a bump, a knock, a genetic deficiency, a plague of community death, a scourge, a hanging. Skeletons in the cupboard have their own ill radiance. See those bones shine. Shin and fibula. And what was a posable thumb? The skull glows its moon-white glory in the harmless abyss. The femur is no longer urged to run, rests in obsolescence, released from full tide glory faster than most. Dumb skeleton keeps secret in screech silence. Don't let the skeletons out of the cupboard. The skeletons put themselves in the cupboard. Someone pushed the people in and they ended up a skeleton, skeletal. Scarecrow, sarcophagus, sacred, bewitched, sinister, sacrament, secret. Let the skeletons out. Let them speak. That's better. What a relief. Nothing. Nothing is not nothing. It's really something, something or other. If you've already got something, but if you've got nothing, feel nothing, have lost everything, have never had much to begin with, then nothing is all there is, it's nothing. It doesn't only mean no thing. It can imply no food, no ideas, no future, past, nowhere to go, to hide, connect, to disappear to. This nothing might be a term of derision. Someone applies to another. Or a liberation. If we've stepped on someone's toes inadvertently and they say, Ouch! Oh, never mind, it was nothing. Right. Final. Mystery. Who am I before and after all my words, understandings, complexities and adventures?